Welcome to the Cloud Pod, where the forecast is always cloudy. We talk weekly about all things AWS, GCP, and Azure. We are your hosts, Justin, Jonathan, Ryan, and Peter. Episode 90, recorded on October 14th, 2020. The Cloud Pod gets a nano degree on podcasting. Good evening, Ryan and Peter. You know, it's funny, the title uh, reminds me that we were nominated for a podcast award that we did not win, <sighs> sadly enough. But it's an honor just to be nominated. It was, right? And they're, like, they're now trying to sell me on nomination trophies, which I sort of want to buy just to send to you guys. I think that'd be fun. <laughs> like, we were nominated once. Uh, we, if you look at our competitors, there was no, no reason we would have won against our competitors. They were a really good podcast, but it was, it was an honor to be nominated. But I got to do a really dumb video that I had to record for in case we won for the live stream, which never will see the air of day. So I'm super happy about that. As much as Peter wants me to air it as, a, as an exclusive. Maybe if we ever, do it, uh, ever, ever did Patreon-supported podcasting, maybe we would... Uh, I have that as a backdoor feed. Like you can see my, oh, nice. my <laughs> acceptance speech I never actually got. But uh, uh, yeah, and everything else. But anyways, we have uh, not a long show tonight, so that's kind of nice for a change. Uh, it's been weeks of gargantuan store, uh, uh, shows, I swear. So uh, we have a couple actually interesting uh, side stories tonight, uh, which I always like to do to kind of mix up just a little bit. So first one up, um, you know, you guys are all in on AWS, right? Of course. But you're also all in on Azure and, and Google, right? All in. So apparently the information has uh, caught up to, which information is a, a news publication, has caught up to the fact that uh, a lot of companies are all in on all these vendors, but also all in on all the other vendors. And so they posted an entire article about the boasting of exclusive cloud customers who aren't, uh, which a whole takedown of the fact that uh, all-in customers are not really all-in. Uh, they pointed out to OpenAI, uh, who we actually talked about here on the show when they uh, released their OpenAI supercomputer on Microsoft Azure, uh, where they dubbed it the primary cloud provider. Uh, but you know, however, in July 2019, according to internal sources, uh, they're a top 10 commercial customer for Google. Since 2018, they have been that. Ooh, oopsie. So it can't really be the preferred only to Microsoft if they're also on Google. Uh, as well as, you know, we've seen other companies say we're all in on AWS, then all in on Google, and, and vice versa. And really, at the end of the day, uh, it's a gimmick. <laughs> so always remember that. It's a, it's a way for them to communicate that, hey, this customer selected Amazon for a thing or Azure for a thing. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's really about that company trying to get more brand recognition on stage because maybe they get a keynote slot. Uh, or some other thing out of it that makes them seem better and more awesome. And so it was kind of funny to me, though, that some other mainstream media finally picked up on what we had always known all along, which is that <laughs> All In is kind of a BS story. I wonder how much of it is, you know, like business priorities changing. Uh, you know, like it, you know, maybe there's honest intent, but then, you know, plans are, you know, like uh, it turns out, you know, devil's in the details and the implementation or plans just really aren't there. Or they don't have full commitment of the rest of the business. Or I wonder. I mean, I know I know it's an honest gimmick, but I just wonder like how much is genuine. Yeah, I'd I'd imagine there's some correlation between agreeing that you are can be tagged as all in and your private pricing. Yeah, it, it's just the ability to come out and say, hey, this is our vendor and we're going with them. Yeah. Or you you acquire a company that all of a sudden happens to be in a different cloud in a big way, and are you really going to take the time to lift and shift? That client from Azure to AWS or to GCP or whatever your preferred cloud provider is, it just doesn't make sense to do that. Once you're on cloud and you're getting the benefits of that lock in and the other things that you're supposed to get there, I just don't see it. But you know, and the other way you know this is all BS is because everyone worries about multi cloud, you know, in a big way. And so that's, you know, as much as we say all in or exclusive or premier customer, then all of a sudden they come in the next breath like, well, we're multi cloud and we need multi cloud solutions. Well, why do you need that if you're all in on AWS? You don't. So that's. That's been kind of our argument here, too, about why AWS needs to get better about acknowledging multi-cloud exists and making tools that work across clouds, because that's what all their competitors are doing to them. Everybody always does it to the leader. The leader doesn't necessarily do it back. <laughs> Sometimes it's their own, own mistake, I think, at some level. But, you know, because now it's just harder to get back from those other clouds back to AWS where I want to be. Well, the next one up is uh, Palo Alto has beefed up their multi-cloud security platform, Prisma Cloud, which I still contend is a terrible name. <laughs> still, I still hate Prisma Cloud, uh, which for those of you who have not been paying attention, Prisma Cloud is what they did with Redlock, Evident.io, Twistlock, and PureSec. Uh, they moved them into a new business unit, basically, and said, you are the cloud business unit. 
uh, at Palo Alto, which is separate from their course connection firewall and then all their security insights and intelligence business, which are the three main parts of Palo Alto. Uh, they did purchase a company called Apparetto last year. Uh, and so that now has new tools coming to the cloud product family uh, for Prisma, including a new data security module that adds DLP capabilities for Amazon S3. Uh, as well as a, sec- a new web API and app- oh, sorry, web application and API security capability that protects against layer seven threats, which I guess is a WAF, but they don't call it that. Uh, and then identity-based microsegmentation, which is all about zero trust in your system. Uh, this provides end-to-end visibility for network communications and comprehensive security policy control and management tools, all for the low, low price of a lot of money. Yeah, yeah nothing low, low about that price. <laughs> yeah, DLP out of S3 always interests me because I mean if you're going to take the P in prevention it would imply that you're actually uh, getting in between the user and the public Amazon API calls which always seemed a bit tricky to me yeah I don't think most DLP services are actually doing live scanning it's more just identification of PI data so that you can then you know prevent it I think is is sort of the uh well, what you really want is you want the detection of the DLP data you know, on the cloud so you know where that is, so you can identify where your hotspots are. But then you want to partner that with a DLP application on your laptop or your endpoint device so that when I go access that DLP object, I now know I accessed it and that I've modified it in some way so that can be tracked from an audit trail perspective. But typically, I don't need to prevent at the storage level. It's whatever's connecting to that that I need to know that I'm now connecting to data that's sensitive in some way. Yeah. So we should like call it data model where it's a loss service that you can use and detect DLP in real time and then either apply masking or tokenization and then you know you're really preventing it by not even saving it in the first place. Why wouldn't we store it? Data privacy is a thing. (laughs) So we can store it, right? (laughs) (laughs) Not only should we store it, we should log it in our application logs. Here's my credit card number, my social security number. As I as I gingerly you know voted in my ballot on the you know do I allow more data privacy rights in California or not I'm like hmm, well on my day job side that's probably pretty bad on my personal <laughs> life side I really like this idea I'm not really sure how to vote on this one <laughs> yeah has that trickle down effect like hmm, that might impact my job someday uh, you know it's yeah always one of those things you have to worry about when you're dealing with tech or legislation hey everyone Jonathan here. I just wanted to take a minute to thank the cloud consulting gurus at Foghorn for helping make the cloud pod possible. These folks truly get it. Cloud consulting experts since 2008, they are premier tier partners with AWS, Google Cloud Platform Silver, and Microsoft Azure partners. From multi-cloud to containers to moving full production workloads to the cloud under the tightest compliance, Foghorn's team of full-stack cloud engineers have been there, done that, gotten the t-shirt, and are ready to share their experience with you. If you're in the market for some talent to supplement your team, visit www.fogops.io slash the cloud pod. www.fogops.io slash the cloud pod. Foghorn, the promise of cloud delivered. Uh, Well, Red Hat has finally answered uh, their solution to Kubernetes cluster management and Ansible. Uh, they released a advanced ans- or sorry advanced cluster management capability for Kubernetes uh, earlier in the year, which was focused on mostly OpenShift, making OpenShift easier to use. Uh, now they're coupling that with Ansible and the Ansible automation platform to make all of that much much easier. Uh, the integration of Ansible and Advanced Cluster Manager is intended to reduce the number of tools and handoffs between siloed IT organizations and groups. Uh, there's also a new version of the Ansible automation platform. Uh, with this, which includes the Ansible Content Collections, which is an automation and services catalog and private automation hub, all designed to give you quick, easy, uh, repeatable code snippets to do all of your common tasks. So just like Terraform modules or providers, etc., these are the same type of things, but for Ansible. So if you're a big Ansible fan, uh, which I know some of us are here on the call, uh, that is a great way to get started with Ansible and really help accelerate your Ansible transition. So the only thing that's going to make Kubernetes easier to manage is a whole bunch of you know, Ansible catalogs and code that you don't own or understand to get your clusters up and running. It makes sense. I mean, arguably, those all already existed. They just weren't, you know, put into a central place and yeah. vetted so by the community. True. They're just some guy found on a forum who's like, hey, I created this Ansible provider. This one works. This for magic. Yeah. Works for one day. Yeah, it works for me. Yeah, it's yeah. scary. Using those community provided chunks of code, whether it be a, um, a Terraform module or uh, playbook or whatever uh, you could use them but you better understand how they work because otherwise when they break you're going to have a miserable time troubleshooting it 
Uh, what could go wrong? We've had Jenkins plugins for 20 years from the community that I have no <laughs> idea what they do. Yeah. Just keep <laughs> plugging them in. Just keep plugging them in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I always say every every Terraform provider I'm ever going to use for community wise, like I better be uh, willing to fork it at some point, right? Because I may have to, and you know, either to support it or you know add some features because stuff you know goes into abandonware so many times. So you sort of yeah. have to make that decision up front, like okay, I'm willing to own this one day. That's how I feel about uh, you know things like Qbot and stuff like that. We used to do chat ops the old fashioned way before Slack and Lambda were a thing. Um, you know, we used to do it all in Hubot, and then you have these plugins, and then you know, the plugin developer would get you know fired or move on to his next job, and then the plugin just sits there, you know, rotting away, and you're just like, if only this plugin actually worked. And then I had to learn TypeScript, and then I get cranky, and it's just a bad, bad day. All <laughs> TypeScript or CoffeeScript or you know one of the CoffeeScript. If you develop like six languages based on JavaScript, like at what point do you just like call? <laughs> bankruptcy on the first one. JavaScript keeps on kicking. Well, uh, my favorite topic of all time is Spinnaker as a service startup Armory has raised $40 million uh, in their next series ra C round, which was led by B Capital. I am going to turn this over to uh, to Ryan because I can't talk about Spinnaker without getting just cranky. So <laughs> through this one. <laughs> You're just turning it over to me because you know I'm going to be cranky. You know how I feel. <laughs> Spinnaker as, you know, open source by NetApp, and it's just a, you know, like it's it's too much of an abstraction to deploy an application, in my opinion. And so, like, the fact that Kubernetes and Spinnaker and all these things are taking off, like, it's, you know, I acknowledge the gap, which is that developers don't really want to push or run the code in production. But I also think that these giant one-stop solutions are not really the the answer. Yeah, there's so many things that are going to be that aren't covered by, you know, a Spinnaker deployment if you're using a SaaS service or if you're using, you know, platform as a service. There's going to be edge cases everywhere. And so if you start using these giant things, like you're just going to end up with this very fragmented deployment scheme where this part's in Spinnaker and this part's in Terraform and this part's a bash script that our DevOps guy wrote. And I'm just not sure that this trend is going to work out long term. I guess we'll see. Let's say it does, though. Let's say Spinnaker works some magic and Spinnaker becomes a super cool tool that allows us to deploy um, container based applications to either our Kubernetes clusters running in our data center or our Kubernetes clusters running on any of the cloud providers with the hope of commoditizing the cloud providers and um, bringing, uh, you know, bringing the multi-cloud uh, uh, goal to enterprises. Um, first off, it's like we've already seen this play out where these companies, you know, build a uh, build a SaaS offering around a open source project and then get really mad when the hyperscalers do the same thing and offer it for free with tight integrations with their cloud to make it uh, make their cloud a, a first class citizen in the tool. Uh, or I guess the, the potential benefit would be if, you know, for the investors of Armory would be if they are successful at that. And then one of the providers decides they don't want to be commoditized and uh, they take them out for a, uh, you know, for a nice, a nice win for the investors of Armory. But then the question is, are the customers of Armory who went there to be multi-cloud happy with that result? I uh, feel like we've seen this story before. We'll see. Are we, are we done talking about Spinnaker now? Can I come back? I mean, you I have more back. points, but they're all grumpy. I, I see it as just a fleecing of <laughs> small enterprises, you know, um, to take an open source software and be like, we can make it run easily for you. It's one of those dev tools, though, that it, it has a stickiness that I don't fully understand. Kind of like Kubernetes originally. I'm like, why do dev teams love this thing so much? I don't mm -hmm. I don't fully understand some of that, which annoys me. And I try not to be just an old curmudgeoning operations guy, but it's so annoying. <laughs> I think it's prescriptive. I think it's easy. I think it defines the one way to do things. There's no... Uh, ambiguity. If you want that, just go use Beanstalk. Like, just save yourself all the headache and just do Beanstalk, and then you get that opinionated way to do it, and you you solved all your problems or Cloud Run or or any of these other frameworks that do exactly what you're trying to get without the complexity of EC2 instances and containerization, which is just a lot of overhead and complexity. Yeah. I don't know. I think you could use a tool like this to build your like. So Beanstalk is you know is Amazon's um, prescriptive method, but a company can build their own, you know, their SRE team or their cloud infrastructure team could build their own prescriptive um, 
method and then allow their developers what they want, which is just, you know, get push, get, and then, you know, PR, merge, and then now we know that that can get deployed every time in a pretty consistent fashion. That makes sense for using Spinnaker, but Armory's hosted or, you know, supported version of it, I'm not sure. Right. Well, yeah, that's that's the question, right? Yeah, what are they gonna? What what value are they gonna add other than spinning up the servers? They give you support, so when you can't figure out how to unbreak your Spinnaker pipeline, that will help you fix it. Gotcha. But I think the uh, I also argue that you know if I'm a SaaS company or I'm a company trying to go down this path of cloud native and trying to get there, I don't know that I want Spinnaker. You know, if if Elastic Beanstalk would meet my needs enough, I don't know that I would want to work that hard to build my own custom version of Beanstalk on Spinnaker to make that happen. It just seems like a not my primary requirement or need, and just focus on what I need to do, which is build my SaaS app. Well, moving on to uh, Amazon stories this week, uh, we only have two from Amazon, which I don't think has happened this entire year. We talked about Azure and GCP having that problem once or twice, but uh, it's a light week on the AWS front. So, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna whiz right through AWS for a change, and then we have a ton of GCP in Azure. So there you go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they're busy preparing for reinvent. Polishing yeah, this this is typically the time we start seeing Amazon announcements start kind of start to take a nosedive as they prepare for reinvent and the, all the reinvent awesomeness that's about to happen. So, which uh, is coming up very very soon. Amazon EventBridge has announced support for the Dead Letter queue, uh, supporting Dead Letter queues, which makes event driven applications more resilient and durable by storing your events in queues when the events can't be delivered or the target is unavailable. Uh, EventBridge is, of course, a serverless event bus that makes it easy to connect apps together using data from your apps, SaaS apps, and AWS services. And EventBridge delivers a stream of real-time data from event sources such as Auth0, Zendesk, Datadog, or PagerDuty, and routes that data to targets like AWS Lambda and others. Uh, the dead letter queues are using the standard SQS method, so they do dust up these into SQS uh, behind the scenes and then use the same dead letter queue mechanism. So if you're familiar with those, you will be familiar with EventBridge deal queues as well. Simple building blocks. Reusable. Yeah, if I was building a new application that would fit this model, like it would be such a relief to be able to so, so easily, you know, communicate directly to my customers and then also, you know, be able to service those events. And then now with resiliency, because that always looks bad with, you know, it's like I did a thing. Where is it? You have to sort of replay it or you have to go manually do a thing. But so, yeah, I love this model. Yeah, doing things like replaying webhooks is one of the worst things ever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What do you mean your endpoint was down? <laughs> I can't replay that for you. I don't know what you mean. Uh, well, Amazon EKS is now officially supporting Kubernetes 1.18. Kubernetes 1.18 has some amazing new features for you, including the topology manager uh, reaching the beta, state, uh, beta phase, a new beta of server-side apply, and a new ingress class resource for the ingress specification, which makes it simpler to customize ingress configurations. Something about ingress, I don't know. Uh, you can also now configure the behavior of horizontal pod auto scaling automatically, and Amazon has said they are now going to be supporting four major versions instead of three, like the traditional Kubernetes uh, process. So they'll be going from 1.14 to 1.18. Uh, I do have to say though that the current version of Kubernetes is 1.19, uh, which was just released on September 9th, technically. So it's only technically a month old. And then I was like, well, when did Kubernetes 1.18 come out? Which was March 25th of 2020. So. By that math, uh, I believe we will have this in uh, April 2021. So Kubernetes 1.19, April 2021. There you go. So To be fair, not, isn't not, it March 257 of 2020? Still today. I mean, it is. It is. Yeah. Uh, so. I mean, it doesn't make it better or worse when it's that far back because yeah. it's like a thousand years between now and March uh, and maybe another thousand years between now and April. So, you know, you never know. <laughs> but I think we'd have to look space. at the difference between 1.16 and release in 1.17, because 1.16 is where they put all that work into their upgrade pipeline. Yeah, and we did see 1.17 came out faster than 1.16, but then 1.18 taking so long kind of killed that momentum. I think if they had been on track, I think they would have shipped in August. They We, we could have said they were improving. I think they're now okay. slipping back a little bit. So there you all go. right. Should we, should we have like an over-under? Should we have a bet Ooh. on when Ooh. it comes out? That's that a, good like a good bet. I mean, I'll definitely take that April date. Like, I'm, I'm firm on that. <laughs> April 2021. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is this pi Price is Right rules where, you know, it's date no, you know, no, no, not just to exceed closest or to, yeah. just closest, closest to? Closest, closest to. to. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep with April because I did the One dollar. So. Uh, yeah, let's see. The holidays. Hmm. The holidays are going to slow everything down. Everything's everything. And you have down. reinvent in the middle, too. So reinvent. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's so it's definitely the new year for sure. But April. Pick a date.
Uh, I'm going to go conservative and go March. What about you, Peter? February. February? All right. Well, there you go. All right. This is a, it easy. A, a, a bet for a very nice, cold, tasty beverage? Or yes. Are you betting, are you betting money? It doesn't have to be office. cold. It could be yeah. something warm and neat, if sure. you'd like. Sure. Fair enough. It just that takes it from like a three dollar glass to like a six dollar glass. But it's fine. Yes. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> so it sounds like you're not very confident about your dates anymore, are you? No, I'm super confident. I I will <laughs> gladly I will gladly buy if uh, they beat that date of April. So because be, that's what I want to see. I want to see Amazon get better in this particular area. They're better in a lot of areas, but this one they kind of suck. Cloud computing has changed the way we live, do business, and stay connected. With everyone using the same cloud platforms, winning and losing comes down to having the best talent to build products better and faster. So whether you're an aspiring innovator looking to level up or a business harnessing the transformative power of the cloud, tech skills and the cloud certifications have never been more important. Cloud Academy has thousands of video courses, learning paths, practical hands-on labs in real-world cloud environments, and tools designed to help teams assess, build, and validate critical cloud skills. Most importantly, Cloud Academy stays agile, challenging you with new content, labs, and tons of features that ensure your skills stay relevant and everyone can level up. They cover everything from major certifications to DevOps, security, and programming languages. Cloud Academy is the cloud training platform of choice for Fortune 500 companies and thousands of tech professionals around the world. Don't just take their word for it. Check out their reviews on G2 and get started now at cloudacademy.com. For a limited time, our listeners can lock in 50% off the monthly price for life. Just put in the coupon code CloudPod when checking out. It's a great way to pursue certifications or just cloud build expertise during this crazy time. Again, go to cloudacademy.com and use the coupon code CloudPod to lock in 50% off the monthly price. Uh, GCP has simplified their beta early access program. So, uh, you know, we talk very often here about different release types for GCP, and there are things like early access, alpha releases, and beta, and then eventually generally availability as well. Uh, and one of the challenges, of course, is that GCP typically uh, doesn't give us any pricing information or SLAs until they go generally available, which is kind of a sucky situation, especially if you just design your entire architecture on some uh, beta capability and then realize it's going to cost you uh, more than a small country in Africa to run. <laughs> so they've simplified that now with uh, going to have two modes, uh, and that is it to avoid the confusion, preview and general availability. Uh, all new GCP products will launch in preview or GA starting as of this announcement, which was earlier in the week. At the preview, products or features are ready for you to test and evaluate. In addition, we'll typically announce a GA pricing for a product at the preview stage, helping you to make those informed decisions, and that is much better than the past. So can we consider this just pretty much no SLA and SLA? Well, not all GA services actually have a, a SLA attached to them either. So, for me, it's I always have a problem even even playing around with a preview service unless you know I really have a line on the product team behind this and they have a very firm direction or have at least convinced me of a firm direction of where they want to take the product. Just because I've been burned by things not being in the region I need or you know that feature is actually did not make GA. You know, those types of things. And so, like, especially if you're designing and developing, I play it safe, I guess. But there are definitely those times where if you're already building something and it's in preview, and it's going to be generally available before you're, you need it to be, then that's times are worth a risk. But if you don't know the pricing, that's a, that's a terrible scenario where you've terrible. invested a ton of money and time on a, a solution and then find out it's not going to work for your cost model without, you know, bankrupting your company. That's not a good scenario. Yeah, I mean, if you're doing something so out there that – you need to be that far ahead of the game on a new service offering. I'd question whether or not you chose the right architecture. I mean, unless you're in the IoT space. But. <laughs> unless that. <laughs> Which I would question other things if you're... Yeah, you know. yeah. There's <laughs> other very fair questions to ask about IoT. Zigbee. <laughs> we need Zigbee compatibility. Yeah. Like, That's why a... does my light switch need as much internet bandwidth as it's taking? That's <laughs> yeah. what I want to know. <laughs> Why is it sending data all the time when I'm only yeah. switching lights on once or twice a day? <laughs> Where's that blink? What is that blinking light in it doing? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, the next up is uh, you know Google Cloud Build Packs. Uh, so we talked about these briefly in a couple announcements uh, previously, where they mentioned Build Packs, but they hadn't really gotten to the point where they really explained them properly until this blog post. Uh, so GCP is launching broad support across Google Cloud for build packs, and open source technology makes it fast and easy for you to create secure, production-ready container images from source code and without Docker files. 
Uh, based on the CNCF build packs v3 specification, these build packs produce container images that allow, follow best practices and are suitable for running on all of the GCP platforms, including Cloud Run, Anthos, and GKE. Uh, build packs typically support uh, several languages, including Go, Java, Python, and .NET, um, although they do mention that you may need to do some special configurations to them, depending on if you have weird builds. Uh, so keep in mind. Uh, but build packs are distributed and executed in OCI images called builders. Each builder can have one or more build packs associated to it, and builders have the ability to auto-detect the language of your source code. So this is accomplished by a simple bin detect executable in the build pack. Once the build pack has been selected, the bin build is executed. The scripts transform your source code into an executable artifact, typically performing actions such as installing dependencies or compiling code. And the output is then put on top of a run OCI-based image, creating the final container image, which that can then be run on the platform of your choice. Uh, Google's cloud build packs use a managed-based Ubuntu 18.04-based image that is regularly scanned for security vulnerabilities and hardened and patched automatically. So uh, this was pretty cool if you're trying to do Docker without the complexities of Docker, I guess, and uh, makes it much simpler to take advantage of these services. I feel like this, this episode is going to be a lot of me just an old man on his in his yard arguing and yelling at clouds because this is another <laughs> another thing i'm just i don't i you know docker files and docker build pipelines just are not that difficult and I, you know like maybe i'm misunderstanding the gap of these things but i feel that the more you abstract away you know the running of software from the development of software the f you know the more bugs are introduced the more the more edge cases that you know happen because of memory constraints or or you know race conditions, and so these things where it's like it automatically detects your code and builds your configuration. You know it's detecting directory structure and you know simple files underneath the hood and just generating you know Docker files for you. But then it doesn't allow you the opportunity to you know get into the details a little bit, understand how it works. Um, you know, like I don't know how many times people have been bitten by Docker layers and the caching that can happen. And so it's like, now, like, none of that matters. Like, yeah, it does. It still matters. It's still going to be a problem, but you will be even further away from understanding it. Yeah, it's moving the complexity somewhere else. Never solves the problem. But maybe it's a quick start for somebody who's trying to get off a of Beanstalk. So it might work out just fine. <laughs> <laughs> Again, you'd have to, like, what's the barrier of entry between a build pack and a Docker file? No code. No code. <laughs> no code. <laughs> <laughs> There's a you point draw, where you I draw see. your build pack with a with a with a pen on and, and paper. Yeah, there's <laughs> a point where I see it. this become. Uh, you know, we use we we take the build pack from the dev team, or then we put it into the Spinnaker pipeline, which then we push out with Ansible, and it's all turtles all the way down to the mm -hmm. infrastructure. That's what happens long term here. There's still an army of poor engineers on the other end of that ops wall, just going, "What the hell is this crap?" <laughs> And what do you mean you don't understand what it does? You just, <laughs> you just put it in a container and you thought it would work? Like, what? Yeah. What do you mean? Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. How much memory does it need? I don't know. It just works. What do you mean you don't know? It just works. It works on, just, worked in dev. Yeah. Doesn't Kubernetes just do that for me? I'm like, why do I need to do this? Well, the Google Cloud Health and Life Sciences Division, in combination with the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, have partnered to provide free access to one of the world's most comprehensive public genomic data sets, the Genome Aggregation Database, or GNOME-AD. Oh, well, these are not the gnomes I'm looking for. Uh, GNOME-AD brings together data from numerous large-scale sequencing projects, including population and disease-specific genetic studies, with more than 241 million unique short human genetic variants and 335,000 structural variants observed in more than 141,000 healthy adult individuals. Hey, how about that data privacy for you? <laughs> 141,000 yeah. individuals. Whoa, it's a lot. Could, is it possible that any of those are me? It's possible. I don't know. If you were ever mapped for your genome, you might be in the, in the collude. I'm sort of disqualified by being not being healthy, so I'm out. Uh, yeah, give me. Ah. <laughs> I wait, I wait for the future when you won't be able to donate blood if you have COVID or something, like one of those weird, weird things in the future. Uh, but no, no AD data is hosted in several formats to address a broad range of biomedical and healthcare use cases. The data is available to you in a hail formatted table and a variant call format or VCF file in the Google Cloud Storage. It's also available to you in BigQuery, which they pull that data via some BigQuery reader for VCF files. Uh, I never heard of hail formatted tables, but all I can see is white hail hitting me when I try to use this because I don't understand any of this data. I mean, I make jokes, but I really do think that this sort of data aggregation really can empower some amazing research. I do hope that privacy is a huge concern and that it's anonymous and, you know, it's been properly scrubbed and cannot be tied back to an individual. But then, you know, the fact that they're also making it part of their public data sets uh, is fantastic because now you're, you know, democratizing this research and 
you know, some yokel like me who wants to do machine learning on a thing or, or statistical analysis um, can go and use this public program to go and play around. It's great. When you when you use machine learning on this uh, genome data, I will make sure to put a disclaimer that not to trust any medical advice given to you by Ryan Lucas at any time <laughs> from his oh, machine yeah, learning. Yeah. <laughs> this is purely purely his speculation of what he thinks uh, yeah. will be helpful. Yeah. Did you know yeah. we're all derived from unicorns? Yeah. The machine model says it. <laughs> says it. Straight there data. It. Yep. it was biased, but <laughs> that poison might be a might be a successful treatment for that. If you if you hear this though and you say to yourself, yeah, this sounds really awesome, but I know nothing about BigQuery, I have a solution for you. Uh, because this month and next month, uh, Google Cloud is giving you uh, no cost data analytics training. Uh, regardless of whether you're just started learning how to get insights from your data or you've already have significant data analytics experience, they have a learning opportunity to help you take care of skills up to the next level. So the first one is a cloud onboarding program called Unleash Your Data Potential, which is a digital event to learn how to quickly and easily generate powerful data insights. Uh, this is over two days, October 27th uh, for the fundamentals and October 28th for how to use the fundamentals with BigQuery. And then uh, if that doesn't strike your fancy or you know about big data, but you don't know about BigQuery, they have a BigQuery hands-on lab webinar on November 6th. The lab will teach you BigQuery best practices from querying, getting insights from your data warehouse to much, much more. And then if you are a BigQuery pro and you're liking, I want to I wanna show the world that I'm certified in this, and I want a boot camp for that. They have the certification prep for the data engineering certification on October 15th via webinar. The perfect place to study up for that Google certification. So there you go. You can now take that learning and go apply it to these public data sets. You please use your own personal credit card and not the CloudPod credit card. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Curses. Well, if you're not if you're not happy with you know free training, I have something even better for you on the Azure side. They have now advanced. They have now offering the advanced Azure Machine Learning Nano Degree Program with Udacity is now available. Uh, Earlier this year, Azure empowered 10,000 students from all over the world to learn the basics of machine learning over the course of four months. And today, Azure announcing the next stage with the availability of advanced machine learning Nano Degree on Udacity. The Machine Learning Engineering from Microsoft Azure Nano Degree Program is available today, and the program lets students learn to develop deeper technical skills in machine learning. And students will strengthen their skills by building and deploying sophisticated machine learning models using Azure Machine Learning. And then you can say I have a nano degree. I don't. I like to put that on my resume and have my first conversation with that in an interview. Like, what's a nano degree? Well, mm. Right. It's this marketing I mean, I, thing that Microsoft came up with once. And well, it's a little bit of a big data joke too. I think, right? Like, because otherwise, it's sort of a demeaning of the de of a degree. I, I'm a little confused by it, but I suspect it's because I'm. I suspect there's a lot of this joke I'm not getting. I don't think it's a joke. I think they're serious, and this is something they're doing. No, I know that it's something you're doing, but calling it a nano degree is it because it's a, a teeny tiny degree? I think they're trying to say it's like if you went and got English 101 class and then you got a degree at the Engli and then English 101, that'd be English nano degree. So they're ju it's just one class, just one competency, and so they're just but they want to make it sound special and important, and that you can put it on your wall so and frame it. I mean, I suppose it's as useful as a certification, right? Like it's sure, I guess so. I, I've yet to uh, run into a candidate that has that skill set, so when I get one, I will ask you why they did it. And I'll let you know when I hear. Uh, well, if you are looking for query examples in your log analytics, Azure has you covered this week with logs experience on Azure has been updated to provide additional example queries for common log alerts. These queries are built for alerting on multiple resources and can be used for resourcing centric log alerts. Uh, query examples for these things are like group by and add filters. Woot. <laughs> And then uh, our final Azure story is uh, Azure and Intel have committed to delivering next generational confidential computing. Uh, Azure claims that your data is your data, and not only is it protected at rest and in transit on Azure, but Microsoft extends that protection while in use with confidential computing, just like uh, Google talked about at Google Next. Uh, Azure, for those, apparently first, although Google said they were first, so I'm not entirely sure who's first, but we'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, but major cloud provider to deliver, com you know, Azure being the first to deliver confidential computing, opening up new levels of privacy and innovation for their customers. Uh, Azure has announced that they are, will be an early adopter of the third generation Intel Xeon platform, codenamed Ice Lake which includes full memory encryption and accelerated cryptographic performance for confidential computing with Intel Software Guard Extensions, or SGX, available early next year to unlock even more confidential computing scenarios for their customers. Uh, and then beyond the hardware, the Microsoft Azure Attestation, or the MAA, MAA uh, further improves security by enabling customers to remotely attest to the authenticity of the SGX enclave at the hardware level, ensuring the latest security patches are installed and that it confirms the integrity of the code running within the enclave. Struggling to even, like comprehend all, all the things here. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you look stunned. You look absolutely yeah. stunned. You, you should probably have another drink of that beverage you have, sir. Yeah, I think a lot more. I'm just going to finish the rest of one here. 
we have to prove so much now and, you know, mathematically sort of deduce our world and be able to run that multiple times and to keep it confidential and keep all these things and be able to prove that. The fact that we have to go so far is, is fascinating. I don't really have anything useful to say about it because I'm struggling to understand it. But. Yeah, well, I just think it's it's missing the biggest target of privacy breaches, which is not going to be people finding a way to tap into the memory of a box, but probably something at the application layer, like somebody did a really bad job of uh, creating their URLs and put private information in the URL. This is getting down to the level where it's like, you know, is it, is it, it feels like the highest hanging fruit to help protect um, private and confidential data. It feels very much like the le least concern of all of the concerns I have, because public S3 buckets are still the bane of almost every company's existence. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and those are much more common, more obvious things, phishing attacks and you know, credential stuffing and those sort of things. But those are much more relevant attacks. But I assume this is sort of a design to, you know, if you have data that is super confidential, that you are super secure and concerned about, like, this is just one more layer you can add into a very complex onion of security layers um, that can help you kind of get there. And, and, you know, Google Next felt it was a next level thing. You know, Azure has now got this second generation of these. Uh, you know, it's interesting, Google partnered with AMD for theirs, <laughs> Intel and Microsoft partnered on this one. Uh, and then, you know, Amazon uh, at reInvent announced the Nitro Enclave. Everyone seems to be into this space for some reason. And so it's either government entities or some other privacy organizations are really pushing as this is a key thing. And all three cloud providers have kind of come out with something in this space when I went into the research. It tells me that it's, you know, I don't fully understand the use cases yet. It's a big deal to somebody. Because it's, it's getting a lot of investment and a lot of time and a lot of interest from not only uh, these three cloud providers, but also the chip makers. I wonder if it's one of those things that's like an interesting problem to solve. So therefore, there's a lot of, you know, it's easy to sell in, in, for funding inside of a business or, you know, the, the smart the smart math nerds want to tackle this as far as, you know, cryptography or the math computer nerds want to want to do it. Like, I wonder if it's one of those things or I wonder if there really is like a secret, you know, or not secret, but like a large demand for this confidential computing. There are policies that are written that require that basically you can't use shared infrastructure because, you know, well, the the information is unencrypted in memory. If they were presenting this as that use case, this is an alternative to dedicated hardware hosts yeah. uh, for data protection, then I, I could think I could understand a lot better. I think that's a great use mm -hmm. case if that's what they're intending for this to be. But not, you know, it's interesting that none of them have really come out and pointed out that particular use case, as far as I remember from the announcements from Google and Azure. Yeah. Um, they all talk about, you know, this need for continuously confidential and not decrypting in the middle. And that it may be partially tied to the, you know, shared security model of like, well, if you're unencrypted in the memory space of the server, you know, and an Amazon person or an Azure person, you know, has access to that memory, they could take data out of the memory, I guess. Yeah. Um, or, you know, another rogue actor on the host can actually look at that data unencrypted in the memory space. But, you know, again, that's why we have things like Nitro and other things to help protect that. But, yeah, I, it would be nice if that was the marketing campaign versus, you know, what they're kind of doing now, which is that there's these benefits, these certain type of companies that is not me or Ryan or Peter. No. Um, but that is this group that is apparently very vocal and very adamant that this must be there. But I'm sure there's a more common use case than just one type of customer than this. Yeah, probably. Yeah. I mean, because if you think about the Nitro story, like, it, you know, they, they sell that. I mean, the enclaves are a little different, but the, the regular Nitro, like, they sell that more as isolation, right? More de mm -hmm. dedicated, um, you know, so you, you, to deal with noisy neighbor problems and, you know, and also gives them hooks to, you know, better, better add things to inside that Nitro card, you know, so they can empower things like, you know, e EFS for Lambda functions or, or what have you. And so, like, I like that story a lot better than... Than this one, which I don't. Yeah, I guess like this one just freaks me out. Like, are we are we're this worried? Like, do I, I should be a lot more worried than I am then, because mm -hmm. I'm not even I'm not even near concerned with this level. Yep. I have so many other layers that I'm more concerned about mm -hmm. for, personally. <laughs> so I, yeah. I'm, I mean, if, I, if this is the one I'm worried about, then I'm super happy because everything else I have is super secure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, well, that's it for this week in uh, new news. Uh, we're gonna take it to the lightning round for a quick lightning round this week. Quick and dirty, head to head matchup as well. Yeah, is, there's a lot of there's a lot of pressure on me. We'll I'm see if least. anybody has anything to say about <laughs> our few items that we have today. Uh, Azure Files Premium tier, our favorite tier, is now available in more regions with LRS, ZRS, and NFS support. Does it have a IDC support, uh, Peter? As in, I don't care. 
Uh, <laughs> AWS Glue supports reading from self-managed Apache Kafka. Wasn't that always the way the mob worked? You, you put the feet into the glue, and then you dump them off into the river? Isn't that the Kafka-esque way to do it? Is that what that is? This seems like a very good model of, like, I don't care about this data. Apparently someone needs it, so I'll, I'll drop it into Kafka, which is how Kafka is generally used. And then we'll use glue to somehow maybe make sense of it on the other end, which won't work. Did you just clear up Apache Kafka, the payday lender of data? Yes, I did. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Dump it there. It's fine. It'll be there at least 24 hours. And then uh, so hopefully someone will figure out what to do with it before it expires. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> AWS Cloud Map simplifies service discovery with optional parameters. Cloud Map continues to be very optional for me. I don't yeah. know about you guys. I don't know what to do with this thing. Well, nothing simplifies a deployment like a whole bunch of optional parameters that may or may not be filled in. That makes them optional. AWS Lake Formation now supports cross-account database sharing. I was disappointed they didn't name this AWS Lake Confluence, you know, as basically they come together like a river confluenting together. Nice. They had a missed miss opportunity. Andy, you failed on the naming. CloudWatch Application Insights offers new improved user interface. If only they're using their own insights to justify their user interfaces. Well, I mean, their, their insights all that, aren't all that great, so they may as well like shine, shine it up a little bit on the user, user interface side. I tried to use the, uh, the log insights the other day uh, during a, an incident that I had that I couldn't access our logging platform, uh, which is a common problem right now. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. So I was like, oh, I'll use this new use this log insights thing. And like, it has a custom query language I've never seen before. And I'm like, oh, god, why? And I bailed out pretty quickly. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, this what is, happens. well, I don't know what insight is here. Log insights. You mean log yeah. bastardized Athena query log insider? Yeah. I guess I don't, I don't the know. The only insight I've gleaned is that they do not want to maintain an index of your data. <laughs> That's very clear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As your data lake storage, immutable storage is now in preview. Can't wait to hear about how uh, the data lake team messed up the architecture and schema and now can't fix it. This is going to be fantastic. This won't cost anyone money. Not at all. Not at all. All right, I got to give the uh, I got to give the trophy for today to the creation of the new acronym, IDC. <laughs> nice, nice. Good job, Justin. That one that one took a little while. I'll, I'll admit yeah. that one. I was like, I, I can make this funny, but I'm not quite really sure how. And then I was a little worried. I'm like, I don't I I don't know what that is. Do I? Do I have to get, like, is this going to send me off into, like, you know, an expedition of learning, <laughs> a new file system? Or <laughs> Good thing I didn't put it in the show notes in advance. Then, then you go to really spend some time on it. Like, I know. Yeah. It could have been bad. Have you guys heard about this new IDC protocol? Because yeah. it probably exists. I'd probably it find probably, it. it. It probably does. <laughs> it, the re end, end of the day, there's an acronym for everything, right? Isn't IDC like a magazine, like a one of our... Yes, there is. A, oh, the inter-domain controller specification is IDC. Yes. Oh, God. You, oh, I dodged a bullet. That would have been yeah. rough. Yeah, that would have been a whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, I'm glad I I'm glad I, I saved that for you. So you didn't. Have to do it. It has to do with the uh, has to do with VLANs and uh, dynamic networking. So yeah, oh, all good all good stuff. I would have eaten this up. I would have spent and hours. It's, and it's pretty current. Somewhere. It's not like it's it's from February 9th, twenty twenty. The specification for this for the one dot one specification. So it's not that old. Yeah. So you know maybe maybe someday we'll talk about a real IDC. That makes yeah. Sense. Hey. In the cloud context. So. Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, due to Jonathan's uh, internet, we have lost his uh, lovely British charm to the show tonight. But uh, hopefully he'll be back with us next week and the rest of us uh, here at the Cloud Pod. So have a great week in the cloud. Later. Bye, everybody. And that is The Week in Cloud. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Foghorn Consulting. Subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and tweet us your feedback at hashtag the cloud pod or join our Slack channel. Go to our website, thecloudpod.net for sign up instructions. Mm -hmm.